from St. Paul's Baptist Church. Here's the scoop. Opinions about Jesus are endless, ranging from the ridiculous, like he's the key to a Super Bowl victory. He's the giver of Porsches and yachts, to the simplistic, like he's my ticket to heaven, he's my best buddy, to the skeptical he's outdated and irrelevant, if he even existed. But the real question is, who do you say that he is? This series will help us answer that question by examining Jesus' own words, his I am statements in the Gospel of John. In several memorable statements, Jesus revealed what he was all about and why he still matters. So, who do you say that he is? It's life's most important question. Join our senior pastor, Dr. Lance Watson, as he leads us on this journey of discovery. This Lenten season, we're seeking a deeper relationship with God and a greater relationship with each other. Tomorrow begins week three of our challenge. Remember, perfection isn't the goal, progress is. Keep going. Download the guide for week three at myspbc.org and subscribe to Daily Scripture and Prayer by texting Lent 2024 to 804-643-4769. Every member is also encouraged to give a special offering of $40 during the Lenten season. Don't forget, in place of our weekly 714 prayer, we're enjoying daily prayers from our deacons and intercessors. Also, meet us at the bridge on Thursdays at 11 a.m. and 7 p.m. for our 40-day challenge study series on myspbc.tv, YouTube, and Facebook. Don't miss our Good Friday, 7 Last Words service, at 7 p.m. on Friday, March 29th at our Creighton campus. Experience 7 dance movements and 7 ministers preaching for 7 minutes, recalling the 7 last words of Christ. Invite your family and friends to worship with you this Easter, Sunday, March 31st. Join us at 9 a.m. on our Creighton campus at 4247 Creighton Road or 1130 a.m. on our Belt campus at 700 East Belt Boulevard. If you're not able to celebrate with us on campus, we'd love to worship with you online at 9 a.m. at myspbc.tv, on Facebook, YouTube, or on our mobile app. You can also join us by phone by calling 855-905-7023 and then select number one to subscribe. Our next community fresh food distribution is Friday, March 8th, in partnership with Martin Luther King Jr. Middle School, Nia Incorporated of Greater Richmond and Feedmore Incorporated. Distribution begins at 4 p.m. at Martin Luther King Jr. Middle School, 1000 Mosby Street in Richmond. Enter the parking lot from 18th Street. Volunteers are appreciated. For more information, email outreach at myspbc.org. On Friday, March 8th, from 4 to 5.30 p.m., the St. Paul's Baptist Church in partnership with Urban Baby Beginnings, Nia Inc. of Greater Richmond, and Martin Luther King, Jr. Middle School is hosting a community diaper pop-up at Martin Luther King, Jr. Middle School. Appointments are required to ensure adequate inventory. Register today at myspbc.info slash diapers to select your pickup time and sizes needed. For more information on this or any of our outreach initiatives, email outreach at myspbc.org. Parents and guardians, we'd love for your kids and teens to be part of our Sunday school programs for children and students at our Belt Campus in our newly updated education building. Classes for children ages 5 through 5th grade are held in the Imagination Wing at 11.30 a.m. on 2nd and 4th Sundays. Classes for middle and high school are at 11.30 a.m. on 2nd, third and fourth sundays for information email imagination at myspbc.org or smb at myspbc.org we give praise to god for our new members every new member is required to complete our dna class it's a one day 90 minute introduction to our church family see the class schedule and login details at myspbc.info slash dna Thank you for your time and attention. This has been The Scoop. Good morning, St. Paul's. Good morning, St. Paul's. The Bible says, make a joyful noise unto the Lord, all ye lands. Serve the Lord with gladness. Come 
before his presence with singing. He says, know ye that the Lord, he is God. It is he who has made us and not we ourselves. The Bible says we are his people and the sheep of his pasture. He said, enter into his gates with thanksgiving. One more time, enter into his gates with thanksgiving and his courts with praise. Give thanks unto him and bless his holy name. He says, for the Lord is good. I say the Lord is good. Let's testify that the Lord is good. His mercy lasts forever and is truth unto all generations. Let us pray. Spirit of the living God, fall fresh on us today. We, your sons and daughters, gather in your presence on this first Sunday with hearts full of thanksgiving and praise. God, if we had 10,000 tongues this morning, we couldn't thank you enough for all the ways you made, for all the times you kept us, from all the times you protected us, from all the provision, God. God, we say thank you on today, God. And God, your word says that you inhabit the praises of your people. So Holy Spirit, come and take your seat in our midst. Breathe on us. Move the way you want to move. God, we need an encounter with you today, God. God, if a deer pants for water, oh, Lord God, our soul hunger and thirst for you. So, Lord, meet us here. Manifest your presence. Manifest your power. Manifest your glory. God, we don't want to leave this place the same way that we came in. So, Lord, have your way. Do what you want to do, how you want to do it. And we'll be sure to give your name all the praise, the honor, and the glory. Come on and put your hands together and tell God thank you. Come on and give him glory. Come on and give him glory. It's in the name of Jesus we pray. Amen and amen. Praise the Lord, everybody. Come on, praise the Lord, everybody. For this is the day the Lord has made. We shall rejoice and be glad in it. Song says, I'll praise your name. Anybody come into the house with praise on your lips? Hallelujah. Come on, clap your hands right here. Song simply says, I'll praise your name, your holy name. I'll praise your name, your holy name. I'll praise your name, not just today, but always. Now and forever, Lord, I praise your name. Everybody say, I'll praise your name. Your holy name. Your holy name. I'll praise your name. I'll praise your name. Your holy name. I'll praise your name. Not just today. Not just today. But always. But always. Now and forever. Now and forever. Lord, I praise your name. I'll praise your name. I'll praise your name. Your holy name. Your holy name. I'll praise your name. I'll praise your name. Your holy name. We'll make this one big church cry. Everybody rock with me. One, two, three, move this way. Here we go. Let's say it again from the top. I'll praise your name, your holy name. Say it. I'll praise your name. I'll praise your name. Your holy name. Your holy name. I'll praise your name. I'll praise your name. Your holy name. I'll praise your name. Not just today. Not just today. But always. But Blessings come down. Blessings come down. When the praises go up. Blessings come down. When the praises go up. 
voice, we come to shout unto God, say, when the praises go up, 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 come on right here, right here, we're going to say, you can have it, reach up and grab it, say, you can have it, reach up and grab it, got it, you can have it, reach up and grab, point to your neighbor, say, you can have it, just reach up and, everybody, you, you can have it, reach up and grab it, you can have it, you can have it, reach up and grab it, reach up and grab it, you can have it, you can have it, reach up and grab it, reach up and grab it, your neighbor, say it, you can have it, reach up and grab it, reach up and grab it, say you can, you Praises go up, the blessings come down. Hallelujah. Let's shout that one last time. You can have it. Reach up and grab it. Turn to your neighbor, say, You can have it. You can have it. Reach up and grab it. Reach up and grab it. You can have it. You can have it. We're speaking those things that are not as though they were. You can have it. Yes, you can. Reach up and grab it. You can have it. Take me out right here. Not just today. Not just today. Look at your neighbor and say, neighbor, I have no reason to fear because the Lord is my life. Come on, I need you to clap your hands right here. Help. Tell me who. The final say, Jehovah has the final say. Tell me who has the final say, yeah. Jehovah has the final say. And no matter what the doctors say, Jehovah has the final say. And no matter what the bills may say, yeah. Jehovah has Come on, the lift your final hands up. say, I have. Lift your voice and say it. Say, I have. I have no reason to fear. Say, I have. I have no reason to fear. The Lord is my life. The Lord is. The Lord is my life. Hallelujah. Tell me who has the final say. Jehovah has the final say. Say, I have, I have 
no reason to fear. Say, I have no reason. I have no reason to fear. Come on, lift it up and say, I, I have no reason to fear. I have no reason to fear. I have no reason to fear. I have no reason, I have no reason to fear. I have no reason, I have no reason to fear. I have, I have no reason to fear. He's walking right beside me.
serve it to God Hallelujah. with the voice of triumph. Thank you, God. Hallelujah. Just lift your hands all over the room. Father, even in our weakness, we find strength in you. So right now, in the midst of what is unsettled in our lives, Father, we submit it unto you this morning. Every problem, every circumstance, even what we don't understand, we lay it at the throne of Jesus. So with uplifted hands, come on, open up your mouth and say, God, you are my strength. Come on, say it again. Say it, Father, you are my strength. Strength like no other. It reaches to me. Come on, clap your hands all over the room. song simply says, you are my strength. Yeah. Yes, Lord. Thank you, God. Strength like no other. Yes, yes. Strength like no other. Yes, yes. Reaches to me. Yes, yes. You are my strength. Yeah. Hallelujah. Thank you, God. Strength like no other. Strength like no other. It reaches to me. Come on, lift that up right there in part. Say it. You are. You are my strength. Come on, say it. Strength like no other. Strength like no other. Strength like no other. Strength like no other. Reaches to me, say. Reaches to me. Father, we thank you for being our strength and our weakness. You are, say. You are my strength. Strength like no other. Strength like no other. Strength like no other. Strength like no other. Reaches to me. Reaches to me. Come on, let's declare it one more time all over the room. You are my strength. Say. You are my strength. Hallelujah. Come on, strength like no other. Strength like no other. Strength like no other. Say. Strength like no other. It reaches to me. Reaches. Come on, let's go to that next part. It says, in the fullness of your grace. In the fullness of your grace. And in the power of your name. In the power of your name. The name that's above every name. name. Say it, you lift me you up. You lift me up. Father, you lift me up. Hallelujah. I'm so thankful today. You lift me up. Come on, say it again. In the fullness, say. In the fullness. the power of your name. In the power of There's your no greater name. name on earth. You lift you me up. Lift say. Me up. Yeah, yeah. You lift me up. Say. You lift me up. Come on, take me back to the top right here. Say, you are my strength. You are my strength. Come on, that's the whole song right there. Strength. Strength like no We've come to declare it right now in our weakness. Strength week. like no other. Reaches to me. Reaches to me. Come on, y'all sound real good. Lift it up and say you are my strength. You are my strength. Yes, you are, yes, Jesus. Lord. Yes, Lord. Strength yes, like no other. Strength like no other. No other name I can call. Strength like strength no other. Like no in the midst of my weakness, you reach this to me. Reach Come on, let's go to that second part right there. In the fullness of your grace. Yeah. In the fullness 
Everybody saying you are you are my strength. Come on, lift it up to the heavens. Thank strength you. like no other. Strength like no other. Come on, church, lift it up. Strength like no strength other. Strength like no other. Reach as to me, he said. Reach as to me. Come on, team, don't sing church. Open up your mouth and say it. You are my strength. Say you are. That's it right there. Yeah. Strength like no other. Say it. Come on, declare it. Declare it. Strength. Reaches to me, say. Reaches. Come on, through him we find our strength. Open up your mouth, say, you are. Come on, somebody walked in the room weak in spirit, say, strength. Strength like no other. Say it. Strength like no other. Last time right here. Reaches to me. Say reaches. Reaches to me. Come on, somebody bless the name of Jesus here. Come on, somebody bless the name of Jesus here. Hallelujah. Father, we thank you for being the strength of our lives. Father, we thank you for being the lifter of our heads. Hallelujah. Put your hands together and give the Lord a praise if he is the strength of your life. Good morning. Let's all stand together. I want you to smile real hard. Stand real quick. Shake hands with everybody around you and say good morning. Good to see you. God loves you. I do too. If you want to take a selfie, pull out your cell phone. Get out your digital device. Take a snapshot of the people on your row. Post it and tell somebody, I'm in church today. In Jesus' name, amen. He is our strength, strength like no other. And God, as we gather today in worship, we give you all the glory, all the honor, and all the praise. Thank you for just waking us up to see another day. Thank you that we're in our right mind and that we've got a reasonable portion of health and strength. Thank you for those who surround us, in front of us, behind us, on our left and on our right. And we pause now to pray your blessing upon their life. Let your favor rest on my neighbor and I will give you the glory in Jesus' name. And all the people said amen. 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 Praise God for the ministry of our praise team. Give God praise for them, for their leadership and worship. And every time you see them, I want you to remind yourself that that group right there sang for two and a half years straight through the pandemic. Amen. They were our music ministry every weekend for two and a half years, and we give God the glory and extend to them our thanks. There's a word from the Lord that we'd like to share with you today out of the Gospel of John chapter 9. I want to read in your hearing verses 1 through 5, and from that text talk about I am the light of the world. This is what the text says. As he went along, he saw a man blind from birth. His disciples asked him, Rabbi, who sinned, this man or his parents, that he was born blind? Neither this man nor his parents sinned, said Jesus, but this happened so that the works of God might be displayed in him. As long as it is day, we must do the works of him who sent me. Night is coming when no one can work. While I am in the world, I am the light of the world. And all the people said, Amen. Amen. You may be seated. We're beginning a new series of messages today as we continue to travel through Lent entitled simply, I Am. Everybody say, I Am. When God self-designates divinity as the I Am in Exodus 3, it's a pivotal moment in redemptive history. God discloses 
for time immemorial who God is and what God is like. God is the I am, the unchanging, eternal, immutable, self-existent one, infinite and glorious in every way and above and beyond all created things. And therefore, when Jesus applies the title I am to himself, he stakes his claim on divinity. He has life in himself and he can give life to us. He is God in Galilean cloth. He is as much divinity as humanity can stand. All God's redemptive acts were pointing to his arrival and because he is I am, he is all we need. Who is Jesus to you? In our text, whose tapestry we trail today, Jesus self-identifies and says, I am the light of the world. And as a sign and a symbol that he really is the light of the world, Jesus gives sight to a man who was born blind. Jesus proves who he is by what he does. And if you have good religion, you will show some signs. You will lift your professed identity into the category of demonstrated achievement. Look at your neighbor and say, show some signs. A doctor ought to heal some sick person. A teacher ought to provide education to some child. A preacher ought to have some good news. A child of God should calm somebody's fear, lift somebody's burden, ease somebody's distress, join somebody's church. If God is the strength of your life and Jesus is the center of your joy, show some signs. Chapter 9 opens with an opportunity for the light. Everybody say opportunity. Because as Jesus passed by, he saw this man who had been blind from his birth. And that is the most stubborn and difficult blindness of all blindnesses to address, to have been sightless from the day of one's birth. This man had never seen the light of day, but Jesus, light of the world, did not concentrate his light where there was light already. Rather, he kept on walking around and looking around until he found a man who was blind from his birth. See, in our world, the trend is always in the opposite direction because money seeks money and marries money. Celebrity courts and marries celebrity. There is no attempt to be inclusive, egalitarian, or democratic, but Jesus, the light of the world, goes where he is needed most. In our world, intelligence seeks out intelligence, and if you cannot boast a high GPA or manufacture a marvelous SAT score, you can't get into Harvard and Morehouse, Spelman, Stanford, Yale, or MIT because most of our top universities cater to the intellectually elite, having little patience with slow learners, bad readers, and late bloomers, but Jesus, the light of the world deliberately and determinately moves in the direction of the darkest midnight and the agonizing misery of a man born blind. His disciples asked, Master, who did sin, this man or his parents, that he was born blind? Because when the disciples saw the blind man, they felt no desire to help him. They wanted only to hold court and fix the blame and not solve the blind man's problem. Reinhold Niebuhr once wrote, there is something about the pains and problems of other people that does not make us unhappy. Shame on all of us, because too often we are attracted to the troubles of other people, not to transform them, but just to talk about them. We are often more nosy than we are sympathetic, more curious than we are compassionate. Because whenever you are dragged on the internet or summoned into a legal court or accused of just about anything or put through some agonizing trial or made to endure some hard and debilitating sickness, some people will come around you to encourage you, but others will come around you just to stand over you, hold court, fix the blame, talk about your situation, and leave your problem untended. 
the disciples of Jesus did not ask how the man was to be cured. They did not ask how the man could be helped, how this blind beggar could be changed into a sighted achiever because to them, he was only a specimen, just a statistic, just a starting point for their theological discussion. And similarly, we study the homeless but will not house them. We track low academic achievers in failing, poorly resourced schools, but will not educate them. We trace the epidemic and pandemic diseases of the world, but will not cure them. We are often content to call a conference, post some quotes, and cite some statistics. But here again, Jesus, the light of the world, goes against the mainstream. He did not buy into the notion that the man's problem was caused by the man's sin, nor by his parents' sin. For such blaming the victim as we are prone to do was not on the mind of Jesus, because when you blame the victim, you let the church, the community, the government, the business community, and the entire society plumb off the hook. And Jesus is not concerned about getting off the hook. He's concerned about getting on top of the problem. Jesus wants to do something with the problem, to the problem, and about the problem. So he says, neither is this man sin nor his parents, but that the works of God should be made manifest in him. We must do the work of God right now. Grace hurries to help those whose problems seem beyond solution. Jesus did not taunt this tortured soul with the idea that he was beyond help because he brought the malady upon himself. That judgmental point of view would have made Jesus indifferent, cold, callous, and cruel in the face of a terrific problem. It would have added more weight to the stress of the burden already being borne by this poor soul. Jesus does not speak here of causes. Notice he speaks of results. He said this man was born blind with the result that the work of God might be made manifest in him. It was precisely because of the man's blindness that this man was strategically situated to be the screen upon which the light of the world could be focused. The blind man became living, visible proof of who Jesus is and what Jesus can do, not only for him, but for anybody who was willing to trust and obey. A seeing person would have been of no use to Jesus in this ministry because, hear me, there is a ministry of suffering that wholeness, health, and prosperity cannot perform. In Thornton Wilder's play, The Angel That Troubled the Waters, a newcomer to the pool of healing opportunity, begged the angel to be healed, to be relieved of the flaw in his heart and the defect in his character. But the healing angel in that play would not heal this particular man who had been chosen himself to heal other people. The angel said to him in the play, without your wound, where would your power be? It is your very remorse that makes your low voice tremble into the souls of men. The very angels themselves cannot persuade the wretched and blundering children of earth as can one human being broken on the wheels of living. Because in love service, only starred hands can heal. God uses suffering to furnish our salvation. Only the agitated strings of a violin will vibrate in the music. Only an irritated oyster can produce a pearl. Only a crushed flower can release perfume. Only a broken seed will grow into a strong tree. And only a crucified Christ can save the world. It was the blind man's problem, his sickness, his challenge, and his condition that caught and conveyed the healing power of God. Let me raise the question, why do we have problems? Why do we get sick? Why do we have haters and enemies and critics? Why do we have trouble on the job? Why are our lives filled with so many changes? Why do heartaches visit our homes? These things are opportunities for the work of God to be manifest in us and through us. 
So don't bother about the causes, just look at the result. When evil comes hard and fast upon you, when pain pierces your mortal frame, when ruinous loss erases your economic prosperity, when bitter sorrow poisons your cup of joy, when trouble knocks your door down, comes in and sits down in the living room of your soul, at that moment you ought to look up for your redemption draws nigh. God is getting ready to do something awesome and amazing in your life. I need 81 of you to co-sign that with a loud amen. God is getting ready to change your pain into power, your misery in the music, your midnight in the morning. So Jesus suggests in the text, don't waste your time and your energy trying to analyze and speculate over the causes of evil, injustice, and wrong. Don't frustrate yourself trying to downsize the enormous complexities of life to fit your small schemes of logical understanding. Just go on and work the work of God. No use wasting time and testing time and marking time, waiting for something mysterious to happen. The clock is ticking. The days are passing. It's late in the evening and the sun is going down. The shadow of death has already cast its covering on us. We must work the works of him who sent us while it's day. For the night comes when you won't be able to serve anymore, sing anymore, can't drive in the evening, can't carry it like you used to. So you got to do what you can while you can. We don't have forever to do whatever it is we're going to do. We've been given another year, but it's 365 days are not promised to you. So don't procrastinate. Don't keep putting it off. This is the moment for you to kick that habit. This is the moment for you to lose that weight. This is the moment for you to start to exercise. This is the moment for you to read your Bible and worship every week and give your money and your minutes and share your testimony and register and vote and join the church and forgive whoever hurt you and change your attitude and stop being petty and treat people right and alter your behavior. This is your opportunity. Smile at your neighbor say, I think he's preaching to you today. Amen. Jesus said, as long as I am in the world, I am the light of the world. Then he moved beyond the opportunity to an operation of the light. Jesus spat on the ground. He took that clay mixed with spit mingled with soil, snatched that clay up and rubbed it all over the blind man's eyes, pasting his eyelids shut with that clinging mud filled with spit, and then told the man, go wash in the pool of Siloam. That name Siloam comes from the Hebrew root word Shiloh, which means one who has been sent. Shiloh is a messianic title, and in this context, refers to the baptismal symbol of burial in the body of Christ. So Jesus was in essence saying to him as he says to us, go wash, go bury yourself in the pool of Siloam, go wash yourself in the body of Christ, wash all that dirt out of your spirit, wash all that meanness out of your heart, wash all that resentment out of your mind, wash all that gossip out of your conversation, wash all the lies off your lips, wash all that fear and weakness, compulsion, prejudice, insecurity, injustice, unfairness, disbelief, doubt, distrust, hatred, hostility, malice, spitefulness, and addiction out of your life. Scrub it all away. Smile at your neighbor and say, shout it out, neighbor, amen. This, this man instantly obeyed. Notice in the text, he did not hang around. He did not procrastinate. He did not say like Augustine, Lord, save me, but 
not right now. He did not say, let me think about it for a little while or I'll be back to make a decision next week. He did not say, what is this gooey, spit-filled mess you done put on my eyes? He simply did as he was commanded. He's tapping and pegging his way, his feeble way down the street toward the pool of Siloam. There was nobody in the text to lead him, and yet he found his way walking by faith because he could not walk by sight. In my homiletical mind, I saw that man a few blocks down the street. He had a white stick in his hand. I looked at him with all that mud on his eyes, all that spit dripping down his cheeks with all of that stuff pasted over his eyelids. And I said, man, you look horrible. What's the matter with you? He said, preacher, it ain't how I look. It's where I'm going. That's really important. I said, where are you going? He said, I'm going to get me some brand new eyes. I said, who told you that? He said, a man named Jesus. I said, who is Jesus? He said, I don't know. I've never seen him before, but I'm just doing what I heard him tell me do. And he kept on feeling in his way and tapping his way until he got to the pool and the text suggests he plunged in freely and fully into the pool. We talk in total immersion all the way under the water, not sprinkling. He put his whole body in the pool and he washed all the mud off his eyelids, washed all the dirt off his face, washed all the negativity out of his mind, washed doubt, disbelief, and manipulation out of his heart, watch scheming and plotting and conniving and conspiring from his plans. He watched waywardness and wandering from his feet. And at that moment, something wonderful began to happen. Because when you get in the water and you wash all that mess away, something wonderful will start to happen in your life. Light struck, God touched, love lifted, grace empowered, and the man went home seeing and rejoicing. But there was nobody at his house to rejoice with him. Come here. Opportunity for the light, the operation of the light, but then opposition to the light. Because the man appeared before his neighbors who were not pleased. When the man got home, the whole town turned out to see the miracle of this brother born blind who came home seeing. But if you read the text, nobody outside the man was happy or excited or jubilant about what had happened. Why? Because they had gotten used to his blindness. They were accustomed to his handicap. They had made him a permanent statistic in the column of the truly disadvantaged. They had placed him in the unalterable basement of the underclass of those who were poor and disabled for life. They had no problem with his blindness. That gave them a sadistic, supercilious air of their own superiority, and they used his suffering as a foil for their own self-importance. Talk, preacher, because folks don't have any problem with your trouble. They do have a problem with your triumph. They don't have any problem with your suffering. They do have a problem with your succeeding. They don't have a problem with your pain. They do have a problem with your power. They don't have a problem with your ignorance, but they do have a problem with your intelligence. They have no problem with your confusion. They do have a problem when you get clarity. They have no problem with your flunking out, but they do have a problem with your matriculating and graduating. No problem with your renting something, just don't own nothing. No problem with your sickness, but a huge problem with your strength. No problem with your incarceration, but a huge problem with your education and your liberation. No problem with your sitting in the outhouse, but a big problem when you in the state house and thinking about the White House. That is why. 
affirmative action was gutted. That is why voting rights are obstructed. That is why wealth inequity persists. That is why the haves having mean the have-nots have not at all. That's why the maybes are not the will-bes, which guarantees that the would-have-beens will never be. That is why racism continues. That is why black people are at the top of every negative statistic and at the bottom of every positive one. That is why Jesus Christ was crucified. That's why Paul was beheaded. That's why Peter was crucified crucified upside down. That's why James was eviscerated with a spear. That's why John was incarcerated on the prison Isle of Patmos. That's why Medgar Evers was assassinated in Mississippi. That's why Viola Leopso was killed on Highway 80 in Alabama. That's why Paul Robeson was vilified. That's why Nelson Mandela was jailed for 27 years. That's why Malcolm X was murdered. That's why Martin Luther King Jr. was slain. That's why Obama was excoriated and obstructed at every turn because people have a problem with your strength. The church of God and the people of God are always under attack. So don't rest on your laurels. The church can't live on memory, talking about who we used to be and what we used to do and how we used to do it. That was then. What about now? The devil is still busy. Families are still in trouble. Bodies are still sick. People are still hooked on alcohol, fentanyl, nicotine, morphine, methamphetamines, cocaine, heroin, and crack. Children are still unlearned, unloved, and untutored. Our elderly are still neglected in terms of adequate nutrition, health care, and housing. Our community is still languishing for a lack of affordable housing and economic development. Men and women are still perishing for a lack of knowledge that Jesus saves. We are still under attack, and therefore we cannot rest yet. Tap somebody say, don't rest yet. <clears throat> See, this town had a problem with the blind man when he came home seeing and was no longer blind. You can read it when you get home. The neighbors and those who had seen him in his previous state began to talk among themselves and whisper, saying, isn't this the man who used to sit on the curb begging? And some said, yeah, that's him. And others said, no, nah, that can't be him. It just looked like him. And finally, overhearing their whispering, the man spoke up and said, yeah, I'm he all right. But notice in the text, there was no praise of God, no celebrating, no thanking God, no rejoicing, just questioning, quarreling, and complaining. And that's the way that some people go home every single night. They ain't got nothing good to say about their house or their spouse just questioning, quarreling, and complaining. You didn't cook? Whose turn is it to clean? Was I supposed to pick up the kids? Where's my this and where's my that? And who did this with my that? And who left this little ounce of orange juice in the refrigerator? And of course, what people learn at home, they practice at church on site and online. There's no praising, no rejoicing, no amens, no hallelujahs, no thank you, Jesus, just questioning, quarreling, and complaining. They see nothing good in anything, nothing good in anybody, and that's why some people can't get anything out of church because they never put anything in the church. There was opposition to the light and then a horde of opinions about the light. Can I tell you something? Everybody's got an opinion. I'd have a better amen right there. The man's neighbors were called in before the religious authorities, the keepers of religious regularity, that group of people who make sure don't nothing happen in the temple that ain't ever happened before the keepers of religious regularity who had no problem with the fact that the man had been made to see. But their problem, according to them, was with how it was done. And that's the way to start a fight any day of the week. You can say, I don't mind what you did. It's just the way that you did it that get on my nerves. 
they said, we don't like the way or the day on which this was done. It was done on the Sabbath day. And the Bible we have tells us that you're not supposed to work on the Sabbath. We have the chapter and the verse to prove that we are right. Whoever healed you must have been a sinner. They had a problem with the freedom of Jesus to do whatever he wants to do, when he wants to, how he wants to, with whom he wants to. They wanted the Lord to act only within the narrow boundary of their understanding, their teaching, their doctrine, their belief, and their denominational rules. But God is a great big God. God is a great God. God is too big to be tied up in any one church. God is too large to be locked up in a denominational corner. God is too seismic to be locked up in anybody's race, nation, class, or religion. Jesus Christ can heal on the Sabbath day if he wants to. Jesus can save you in St. Paul's if he wants to. Jesus can find you at Faith Landmark if he wants to. Jesus can live, lift you at Life Church if he wants to. Jesus can deliver you at Mount Gilead if he wants to. Jesus can touch your life at Trinity if he wants to. Jesus can make a way for you at Cedar Street or First Baptist if he wants to. Jesus can stop the genocide of the Palestinians if he wants to. Jesus can give Ukraine the victory if he wants to. Jesus can stop military aggression around the world if he wants to. Jesus can change dictators into diplomats if he wants to. Jesus can turn on the lights in your life anytime, any way, anywhere that he wants to. Jesus can bless Muslims, sanctify Jews, justify Catholics, fortify Hindus, rectify Baptists, save LGBTQIA and LMNOP if he, how he, when he wants to. Jesus is not tied to the temple. Jesus is not nailed to the nation. Jesus is not chained to the church. Jesus is not captivated by the culture. Jesus is not sealed in a system. Jesus is not locked in a location. Jesus is not riveted to a race. Jesus is not domiciled in a denomination. Jesus can work in any place on anybody at any time that he wants to look at both your neighbors and say, I know that's right. See, the Pharisees asked the blind man, what do you think about him? And the blind man said, all I know is that he's a prophet, but that's not what they wanted to hear. So they called in the man's parents and questioned them about the man's situation. Wait, and this is going to blow your mind, because not even his parents could celebrate and appreciate their son's newfound sight. Let's dig a little. Because as long as he was blind, nobody bothered them. But when he got his sight, he was no longer qualified for SSI benefits. Now they had to answer a subpoena to testify in the court of the temple. So they asked his parents, is this your son? Was he born blind? How did he get his sight? They said, we can help you with the first two, but we can't touch that third one. We can tell you he is our son and he was born blind. But if you want to know how he got his sight, you're going to have to ask him. And oh, my brothers and sisters, this is the shouting point of the text because nobody knows but you who God has been in your life. If I want to know what God did for you, I've got to ask you. And if you want to know what God has done for me, you have to ask me, can I testify? Don't hold court on my spiritual, mental, emotional, and religious experience. If you want to know anything about what I've got and what I know and what I've been through, ask me. I've, I've got a ready testimony through many dangers toils and snares I have already come. How did you make it, preacher? It was grace that brought me safe thus far, and grace will lead me on. Look at your neighbor say, ask me about it. 
this man was hauled in before the authorities for a second time and tempers flared, voices were raised, hard lines were drawn in the sand. The Pharisees were determined to reject the source of the man's sight as they clung stubbornly to their own explanations, traditions, and doctrines. They wanted to create a division between the man's sight and the man's savior, between the man's gift and the giver, between the man's redemption and the man's redeemer. And folk do that all the time. They quickly grab their blessings from God, but then just as quickly turn their back on God. Give God no money or minutes, no prayer or praise, because we want God's blessings without God. We want prosperity without paying any price. We want a crown without wearing a cross. We want success without any struggle, roses without any rain, knowledge without the truth, justice without Jesus, peace without the Prince of Peace. They said to the man, take the cash and let the credit go. Take your sight and go for yourself. Deny the Christ who gave you sight. They said deceitfully give God the praise, but they were not interested in God nor the praise. They said keep it a hundred, man. We know the God who touched you was a sinner. He's a pretender. He's an imposter. He healed you on the Sabbath day. His theology is wrong. His religion is bad. His denomination is improper. His faith is inauthentic. But this man understood his obligation to the light that once your eyes have been open you should refuse to shut them anymore so the man responded whether he's a sinner or not I don't know he said I don't know how to judge the man I don't know how to explain my sight I've never been to Virginia Union School of Theology. I've never studied philosophy. I've never taken a course in the history of religion. I've never read William James or Paul Tillich or James Cone or Howard Thurman or Rudolf Otto or Frederick Slymarker or Dietrich Bonhoeffer or Jürgen Moltmann or Albert Whitehead. I don't know what you think. I don't know how you think. I don't know what you feel. I don't know what you've been through. I only know one thing, and I'm obligated to tell it, that whereas I was blind, now I can see. And I might as well tell you today, as I close this little message, there are a whole lot of things I don't know. I don't know why Jesus saved me. I don't know why Jesus has kept me, but he has. I don't know when the Holy Spirit anointed me, but he did. I don't know why God called me to preach when he has so many other better preachers, but he did. I don't know what's going to happen tomorrow, but God knows. I don't know what folks say about me when I'm not around. I don't know what's in somebody's heart. The only thing that I really know is that Jesus loves me. This I know, for the Bible tells me so. Little ones to him belong. They are weak, but he is strong. I don't know how many rivers I've got to cross. I don't know how many burdens I've got to bear. I don't know how many battles I've got to fight. I don't know how many tears I've got to shed. I don't know how many giants I have to face. But let me tell you what I do know. Whereas I was blind, now I can see. Whereas I was sinking, now I'm sailing on the sea of his love. Whereas I was lost, now I've been found. Whereas I was bound, now I'm free. Whereas I was sick, now I'm healed. Let me tell you what I know. I know that I've been blessed. I, I know I've been saved. I know I've been touched. I know I've been delivered. I know that I've been kept. I know that I've been changed because the angels in heaven done change my name. I know God will make a way. I know God will answer prayer. I know God will come and see about you. I know God will lift you up, hold your hand, help you to stand. I know Jesus is the light of the world, the lily of the valley 
the life of the world, a bridge over troubled water, the bright morning star, bread in a starving land. I know what do you know. I know if you wait on the Lord, you'll mount up on wings like eagles. You'll run and not get weary. You will walk and not faint. So I know that God is real. And I've only got three questions as I close this message. And they're for you and your neighbor. So look at your neighbor and say, neighbor, question number one, do you know him? Shake your head at him. Say, don't fool me now. Do you know him? Look at him again and say, question number two. Uh, have you tried him? Uh, look at him and say, don't fool me in here. Uh, have you tried him? Uh, look at him one more time uh, and say, question number three. Uh, ain't he all right? Uh, Jesus uh, is all the world to me. Uh, my life, uh, my joy, my all. He is my strength uh, from day to day. Without him, I would fall. When I'm sad, to him I go. No other one can cheer me so. When I'm sad, he makes me glad. He's my friend. I am a friend of God. Are there any of God's friends here? Then wave your hand in the air and testify to your neighbor. Say, neighbor. I'm never alone. God's got my back. Look at another neighbor and say, neighbor, I'm never by myself because God is my friend. Look at both your neighbors and say, neighbor, neighbor, I can make it. I can take it. I can do it. I can see it because the light of the world is shining in my life. Hallelujah. Stand with me. Stand with me. Take your neighbor by the hand. Look at him say, neighbor, we'll sanitize later, but hold my hand. Look at him say, neighbor, one thing I know, I was blind. But now I see. Put a hallelujah right there. Bless his name. The doors of the church are open. The invitation is extended. The deacons and ministers are in the aisle to assist with this invitation. They'll walk you down. This is your moment to accept the light that only Jesus Christ can provide. All you've got to do is do what he says. Don't have to see it, don't have to understand it, just believe it and act on it, and he will do the rest. This is your moment to plunge into the pool of Siloam, to join the body of Christ and see what God can do in the life of a person who trusts him. You've been talking to your neighbor off and on during the whole service. Look at him and say, neighbor, oh neighbor, this moment right here is the most important moment of the service. Look at him, say, this is the moment somebody's destiny is about to change. Look at him, say, since I'm standing next to you, if you need a little help, I'd love to walk you down this aisle. Would you come now, my brother, my sister, give God a chance with your life Come out of the balcony, come off the wings, come off the main floor. Give God a chance with your life. I see you, let's celebrate him. Let's celebrate them. Celebrate them, there are others. This is your moment. Come now, welcome, welcome. Welcome in the name of the Lord, stand with him. Give the Lord a chance, this is your moment. Every promise. Is there another? Come on. Let go and let God. Don't give up on God. Because he won't. Because he won't if 
Here it is. He's able. He's able. Give God a chance. Give God a chance. I'll see you, my brother, my sister. Somebody shout hallelujah. God is able. Welcome, welcome, welcome. Welcome, welcome. He's gonna fulfill. Welcome, sister. Welcome. Welcome, my sister. Welcome. sisters who have made decisions today, would you give God praise? We welcome you in love and joy and hope and expectation. I want us to pray for you if that's okay. Stretch your hand in their direction. Lord, we give you the glory and the honor and the praise for all these, our brothers and sisters who have heard your word and responded to your spirit. Bless them now in the way that only you can at this new beginning. And we give you the glory as we testify that you are able to do exceedingly abundantly above all we ask, think, or imagine. So work in their lives so that your name might be praised. In Jesus' name, amen. Come on, applaud them again if you would turn to your right and follow our new members team. Let's celebrate them as they go. Celebrate them as they go. Celebrate them as they go. Glory be to God. You may be seated. Praise be to God. We prepare to worship God through the giving of our tithe and our offering our gifts of love. Also during this time, if you lack communion elements, if you lift your hand, one of the members, yeah, you can applaud them. Amen. That's appropriate. That's appropriate. Let's give them one more shout, if you don't mind. Give them one more shout. 
If you don't have communion elements, if you lift your hand, one of the members of our diaconate will bring them to you even as we prepare now to worship through the giving of our tithe and our offering, our gifts of love. There are many ways to give here at St. Paul's. One, you can go to our website at myspbc.org and click on the give link and give there. Secondly, you can use an envelope and write a check. These wonderful men and women in these turquoise covered shirts, turquoise colored. I think that's turquoise. What color is that? Is it turquoise? Okay, it is. I have to ask because people tell me I'm colorblind. Amen. But with these wonderful colored shirts, they have envelopes, and if you lift your hand, they'll be more than happy to bring you one. Or the easiest way to give is you can use the QR code on the screen, take out your digital device, scan it, tap on it, it'll take you to right where you need to be. We solicit and covet and appeal for your financial support because your gifts make our ministry possible. We give not just because we're on the premises, but we give even online because we're standing on the promises. Promises like Luke 6, 38, where Jesus said, give and it shall be given unto you, pressed down, shaken together, and running over, shall men and women pour into your bosom, for with the same measure you give it out, it shall be given to you again. There's one gentleman here with his hand lifted, you see him? Right there, you're almost there. Amen. Lift your hand high, lift your hand high. This is your moment. As we prepare to give now, we're going to pray and remember during the offering as the music ministry lifts us up in praise, if you lack communion elements, if you lift your hands, one of the members of our diaconate will bring them to you. As we prepare to share in this special moment that we celebrate every single first Sunday. I want to remind you as we get ready to pray that we are giving away brand new children's coats in the commons today. So if you have a child, know of a child who may need a coat, they have many, many brand new coats. If you just visit no ID, none of that. We just want to be a blessing to the community. We have been blessed. And so whenever you are blessed, that's the time to be a blessing. So we want to bless somebody if you know a child who needs a coat. Let's bow our heads in prayer. Lord, we acknowledge that you are the giver of every good and perfect gift. So it is out of your abundance to us that we give back to you. Would you bless the gift and the giver in Jesus' name? And all the people said, amen. amen. Just by a show of hands, how many of you are tracking with us during the Lenten season? You have downloaded the Lenten devotional offline. Okay, still time for the rest of y'all to get right because we're doing a different kind of fast this year. We're doing different things on different days. And so if you're tracking with us, Sunday is the Say Kind Words Day. Look at your neighbor, say, how you doing so far? Amen. <laughs> Go on, smile at them, say, I, I can tell you need a little work, amen. But look at your neighbor, look at your neighbor, and say a kind word to them. Just, if you can't think of anything, say, I'm glad to be with you. Amen. <laughs> Tell them, your outfit look good. Tell them, thank you for wearing deodorant today. <laughs> say kind words. <laughs> okay. Whatever those words are, you know. Say, I hope the rest of your day is wonderful because these are disciplines we need to practice. If you have not joined us, members of our diaconate, you see our diaconate moving around in the black with the communion trays. They are praying daily prayers online. All you've got to do is text the word Lent 2024 to 804-643-4769 and you will get the daily scriptures and a link to the daily prayers. You will also get a link 
to our weekly devotional. We are in week three, moving towards week four. We will be celebrating on Good Friday in a very special way at seven o'clock in this cathedral. Seven ministers preaching seven messages in seven minutes. Meaning they get seven, no, it, they get seven minutes apiece. They're not going to do one minute messages, okay. No. <laughs> but they get seven minutes apiece. And that will be married to seven movements of dance and music. It's going to be an amazing presentation for Good Friday as we look forward to Easter Sunday. And Easter Sunday we'll be meeting at the regular time at 9 and 11 30 but on the saturday before if you have a child anywhere in your life anywhere in your neighborhood please bring them to our easter extravaganza on that saturday there's information about our web on our website about it and we are preparing for hundreds of children we're going to have our helicopter easter egg drop 10,000 eggs falling out of the helicopter and the kids rushing to get them. Going to have all types of games and rides. It's designed especially to be a blessing to our children and to create for them an Easter memory. So please mark all these dates on your calendar and plan to share with us. Come on, praise team, and bless us as we prepare for communion. By his stripes, yeah. we are healed. Yes. By his nail pierced hand, we're free. By his blood, we're washed clean. And now we have the victory. And the power of sin is sin is broken, Jesus come and claim it all. Yes, he did. He has won. He has won a freedom. Jesus has won.
the church say amen as members of the diaconate come to the front and join us down front as we prepare for communion let me give you a little instruction if you will put that camera right here I have to give you instruction these are new kind of communion cups and they have to be handled in a certain way so if you have not already opened it turn it upside down right where you are this is how you do it. This is pastor's instruction on communion. Turn it upside down. First thing you do is you got to shake it because they've been sitting on a shelf, right? And you don't want residue. You want drink. So you shake it. Then on the bottom, your bread is on the bottom. So you want to open the bottom first. Open the bottom. Come on. Be obedient. You in church. Amen. Open the bottom. Take the bread out, hold it in one hand. Then you're going to turn your cup right side up. Look at your neighbor, say, how you doing? Come on, we gonna get it right. You got the bread out, be careful, don't drop it. It's a little piece of bread. Turn it right side up. Then just pull it back a little bit. And the Bible says that on the night that Jesus was betrayed, he took the bread. And after he had broken it, he blessed it and he gave it to his disciples and said, This is my body broken for you. Do this in remembrance of me. And in the same way, he took the cup. And after he had supped, he gave it to them and said, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. As often as you do it, you do it in remembrance of me. So we gather today to remember Jesus, his life, his death, his resurrection, his ascension, his intercession, and his soon coming return. Remember how good God has been to all of us, to remember our responsibility to love each other. He prayed, let us pray. Lord, bless these ordinary elements and give them now extraordinary meaning that as we share them together we might be drawn closer to you and closer to each other in Jesus name and all the people said amen in his name let us eat and drink together and we do these things in the name of the Father the Son and the Holy Spirit in the name of Jesus, amen. Stretch out, grab your neighbor's hand across the aisle, across the pew as we prepare to sing our prayer hymn going out. We sing it every first Sunday that God gives us grace to sing it. It's a song that's actually a prayer. It's called Total Praise. It's designed to be sang by you 
to God where you are saying in your song, Lord, I will lift. Listen to how personal that is. I will lift my eyes to the hills knowing that my help is coming from you. For your peace you give me in times of the storm. You are the source of my strength. You are the strength of my life. And I lift my hands in total praise to you. Let's sing it together, everybody. Sing it to the Lord. Lord. Lord I my eyes to the hills. Sing it to the Lord. Make it personal. You and God, you and God, knowing that my help. is coming from you. Hallelujah. 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 Your peace you give me. In times of the storm.